warm welcome. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, Director of Chatham House, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you today to this discussion on a very dramatic title, uh, even pessimistic, on Weathering the Storm, the UK's role in the world today. This is part of our UK in the World program, which John Kampfner has been leading. And I'm delighted to have here today David Miliband, who is President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, dealing with refugees in, I think, 40 countries, bringing them back, and, and dealing with also resettlement in American cities. And as you will know, uh, was also Foreign Secretary from 2007 to 2010, uh, which seems in some ways a long time ago, in some ways not. Um, we can pick on many of uh, those things. He's going to talk to us today. Um, he's uh, written what I think is um, uh, a fascinating speech under, under this title. And uh, I'm going to quiz him a bit. And, but I know there are going to be many questions from you online as well. Please do start sending them in. And um, we will take it from there. So, David, thank you very much. Very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. And thank you very much to all of you for coming. It's nice to be in person. Oh, my goodness, thank you. Um, it's nice to be back at Chatham House and nice to be here under your stewardship, uh, Bronwyn, and looking forward to uh, the conversation. I'm pleased to serve on the advisory board of the Britain in the World project, and uh, I'm happy to contribute to the discussion today and really look forward to uh, some of the points that you will make. H here I want to summarise uh, the argument I'm going to make uh, and the way I see Britain's role in the world. First, that the global context, which I'm going to talk about a bit, is becoming more dangerous. And a coherent British approach to global engagement needs to be based on an understanding of why the global context is becoming more dangerous. Second, that the UK's global influence and capability, but also its reputation, has been seriously undermined by political chaos and economic weakness at home since 2016. The problem is not our global businesses, our global culture, or our global sport. It's our politics, and we need to be honest about that. And thirdly, we need to rebuild, redesign, and reprioritize our foreign engagement at the, government, at the governmental level. And that will take a change of mindset as well as a change of policy. I, I, as I started to draft this speech, I remembered that in 2007, when I became Foreign Secretary, I said that the UK had the chance to be a quote-unquote global hub. We were not a superpower, but we could be a super connector. I made the case, that case because of our presence in all the groupings and power centres that matter, because of the fertility of ideas in the UK about how to manage an age of interdependence, because of our global cultural intelligence, security and development assets alongside our foreign policy skills, and because of our willingness nationally as well as governmentally to commit those assets to global engagement. Now, the fundamentals of that case are not present today, and I think we have to be honest about that. The reality and perception of Britain and its role are both seriously diminished. So the first priority is to stop behaving and talking as if nothing has changed. We do still have global reach and global responsibility. We're one of the richest countries in the world. We're privileged in our position on the UN Security Council. We retain some important global assets. But it seems to me we have an absolute imperative to understand the realities of our power and our responsibility as they are today not as we would like them to be. Our situation, our national situation, the condition of our interests and of our values, including on hot button issues like migration or trade or conflict or development, will get worse in my view unless we seriously get our act together. And that challenge of getting our act together is the challenge for our statecraft. And it's what I want to speak about today. I want to just start with my take on the global context, because I think it's more important and more interesting than um, is generally discussed. President Biden has said that the world is at a quote unquote hinge point. A world richer than ever before has more wars, more refugees, more disasters, more autocrats, more bad actors. And although this may be controversial, I think it's true. 
more distrust of the West than ever before. Now, the US national security strategy deserves, in my view, to be read. One can't always say that about government documents. But it explains the disorder that we face around the world convincingly, in my mind, as a result of two factors. And it's quite blunt about them, and I don't think people have given it the credit it deserves. First, it says that the post-Cold War dispensation of an all-powerful America and a dominant West is over. In other words, the multipolar world is here to stay. I think it's important to say, not just because I'm a resident in the US and need to be allowed back in this afternoon when I get on an airplane, <laughs> Um, that America is still strong, very strong in some ways, and so is the West and the best of its ideas. Just ask the people, men as well as women, chanting for freedom in Iran today. So those ideas are strong. But geopolitical rivalry is back, and geopolitical obedience is over. China, for all that the challenges it faces over uh, COVID, and we may come back to that, does now overtly offer an alternative worldview to the Western ideal. A host of countries, some of them allies of the US like Saudi Arabia, others more independent like Ethiopia, will not do as the US wants. And a wide range of countries, including democracies from India to South Africa to Indonesia, are preoccupied in their global dealings with what they see as the failed promises of the West. But here's what I think is interesting. It's not just that there is geopolitical competition going on. There's a second reason that the national security strategy of the US highlights for arguing that we're at a global hinge point. And that second reason is that global problems, notably pandemics, migration, and climate change, are crashing into front rooms around the world. The old definition of foreign policy, where global public goods beyond the nuclear sphere were seen as nice to have add-ons, not core business, is, if you take this argument seriously, over. Pandemics, migration, climate change are the core business of foreign policy, alongside traditional definitions of security, not separate from it. And here's the way I would summarize this second challenge. It's that risks are increasingly global, but resilience is increasingly thought of at the national level. And it's that gap between global risk and national resilience, sometimes nationalist resilience, that needs to be filled. And if you stop and think, the national security strategy doesn't make this point, but I think it's important. Those two forces that it identifies, geopolitical competition and fragmentation on the one hand, global risk on the other, they interact with each other, they collide with each other and multiply each other. Geopolitical fragmentation means that global risks are not properly addressed. The failure to address global risks exacerbates geopolitical competition and fragmentation. So what I'm putting to you is that there's this vicious circle that you can see. That's why I think it's a dangerous context. So much for that. Let me turn to Britain and the specifics. What I want to suggest to you is that there are four questions that any serious discussion about Britain's role in the world needs to address and answer. About where we start from, honestly. About what we want, what we stand for. About who we stand with, in other words, who are our allies. And about what we can afford. And too much discussion, in my view, does not take those questions seriously. It's a debate that, in my view, needs to go across all the political parties, but it also needs to go well beyond the political parties, which is one reason I was keen or happy to join the advisory group of the Britain in the World project here. We have, in my view, and I say we as a Brit, we have, in my view, suffered from a time of comforting but ill-informed delusions in the last decade. Delusions about our relative power, influence, and position. Delusions that have cost us dear, both strategically and tactically. Uh, Andrew Marr, in his new uh, independent role, where he can say what he really thinks, 
um, says that we lack a national story and that we need a new national story. I don't think that national story should be mired in talk about decline, but nor can it be founded on delusion. Recent governments, plural, have responded well to the Ukraine crisis, and they would argue they also anticipated some aspects of the Ukraine crisis. Our intelligence was right, our armed forces have added value. But it's hard to think of other areas where we've earned real credit. For example, it would be wrong to characterize the Glasgow Climate Conference of Parties last November as a disaster, but it was far from the success of Paris six years earlier, and we do ourselves no favors by pretending otherwise. In other areas of historic strength, like humanitarian aid and diplomacy, frankly, Britain has gone AWOL. For example, I was in Ethiopia uh, three weeks ago. In 2016-17, Britain played a key role, convening as well as funding, in staving off famine in East Africa. Today, we're absent, and people notice that. Our influence abroad, based on pragmatism, legality, procedure, stability, responsibility, commitment, has, in my view, been badly tarnished by our own choices. And this is partly Brexit-related. I'm thinking of the blithe assertions that we quote unquote held all the cards, the inability to find what Brexit means, which continues to this day, the threats to break international law over the still unfinished business of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the continued threats to legislate domestically to override treaty commitments to the European Convention on Human Rights, despite these commitments being baked into other international agreements, including the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, with the EU and the Good Friday Agreement, which underpins peace in Northern Ireland. But it's not just Brexit. This dalliance with breaking international law has extended to uh, thinking about, under the previous Prime Minister, the sighting of our embassy in Israel in defiance of Resolution 242 of the United Nations Security Council. It's included the slashing of the aid budget and I don't need to mention it, I think the unfunded tax cuts that triggered the market gyrations of last month as if somehow Britain was not subject to international rules and norms. Of course, I think it's also important I recognize there's a longer perspective that you could add to this list of errors, including Iraq and the war in Iraq. I get that. But my argument is that Britain in the world has to be about a mindset as well as a policy. And the hubris that we've seen about our negotiating strength in Brexit negotiations, our ability to defy the maths of budget and trade deficits, the willingness, alleged, of Commonwealth countries to defer to British leadership in that institution, or the unlimited bounty of negotiating our own trade deals, that hubris is the wrong mindset. We need, instead, some honesty. And I recommended to the Chatham House Project this that we do a British version of the European Council on Foreign Relations, what they call their Europe Power Atlas, which takes seven dimensions of power from the military to the technology and asks hard questions about where Europe stands. We need to do the same ourselves, I think, for the UK, and I, I gather that's being done as part of the study, which I think is excellent. It's been said that the Truss government made Britain a laughingstock. In my experience, in the US, it was worse. We were regarded with sadness and pity, as well as laughter. And so my take is that we need to reground ourselves, stop shouting Great Britain, as the advertising posters do, and start building it, or rebuilding it. Second, the framing of our foreign policy interests, what we stand for. And here I depart a little from the US national security strategy, and I want to explain why. At the heart of the national security strategy, or at the beginning of it, really, the Biden administration asserts that the struggle between democracy and autocracy is the global issue of the moment. Now, the fact that only 20% of the global population live in countries that Freedom House, which is the, the most respected uh, think tank when it comes to assessing global uh, democratic health, uh, says that only 20% of the global population uh, live in countries that it calls fully free, half the percentage of 15 years ago, should be chilling. 
But a framing of democracy versus autocracy does not speak to international affairs in a way that I think is optimal. Nor does it speak to concerns outside the West about the mistakes of democratic countries or the weaknesses of them. Nor does it speak to countries that are not fully functioning democracies that we need to work to, work with. Nor does it put autocracies on the spot. I would go so far as to suggest that the democracy versus autocracy framing is going to play into precisely the distrust of the West, of democratic countries, that I mentioned up front in my talk. I think there is a better alternative, and that is to stand against impunity in international relations and put ourselves on the side of accountability. In my view, rules versus impunity is the real debate of international affairs in the decade, not democracy versus autocracy, which is pr primarily a domestic policy agenda. And if you actually, it's interesting, if you go back to the uh, post Second World War period, the argument for the so-called rules-based international order was in part that rules at the international level wouldn't bring democracy to international relations, they would strengthen democracy at home. So I'm drawing a distinction here that at the international level, it's impunity versus accountability that's the real issue. Impunity is the abuse of power and is the opposite of accountability. And that abuse today is taking place in the abuse of international law, in the denial of aid to communities in need, because humanitarian aid is a legal right for those in uh, need of it, the undermining of human rights and the attacks on political freedoms and also on the exploitation of the planet, which I see as an act of impunity against future generations. I'm involved um, in the advisory board of a soon to be released project next month, in, in or, uh, not yet in December, in, in January 2023, uh, of a project called the Atlas of Impunity. It's going to rank every country in the world on five indicators of impunity, conflict, human rights, governance, economic exploitation, and environmental degradation. It's revealing this atlas, both that such an index can provide a comprehensive lens on every country in the world. For, for about 40 countries, only there's less than 60% of the statistical indicators. It's based on about 70 statistical indicators. But for 160 countries, there's the full suite of indicators. But also, I think it's uh, significant that such an, uh, an axis can show where, that there's a real battle ahead to curb the, fo the forces of impunity. In my view, the battle for, for accountability and against impunity puts Britain on the right side of the biggest and most difficult political arguments in foreign policy today, from the defense of international law in Ukraine, to support for human rights in Iran, to north-south cooperation on climate change. Of course, the Chinese leadership is hedging on the global system. They want the best of the existing global order, and they want options to get around it. In my view, we need to make every effort to ensure that the rules-based order is the global system. We need to live by it ourselves, and we need to make it strong enough as a magnet to bring in others. And because the rules of the international order commit to justice as well as process, these are existing rules, we should make this the basis of our partnership with countries around the world who don't want to side with China and Russia, but see the West consumed by hypocrisy and self-doubt and wonder if they have any choice about the future. From food security to climate finance to peace building, we need to get back on the pitch. Third, alliances. In the US, one hears a lot about the G7 being described as, a quote unquote, as the quote unquote steering committee of the free world. And certainly, the G7 has found a new lease of life post the invasion of Ukraine. But I want to stress geography, because this is where we have huge ground to make up. In my view, repairing our EU relationship is vital to the economic repair job that needs to be done at home, but it also matters geopolitically. Although the world is a global village, geography still matters in politics as well as economics. And the strength of our partnership with friends in all continents will, in my view, be strengthened by concerted engagement with our own continent. It's good, in my view, that the last prime minister 
went to the first meeting of the European Political Committee. This is the institution that was created by or invented by President Macron. But it's not enough to attend a meeting. We, I think the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister, referred to this uh, last night. But it's not enough to, re to attend a meeting. We need the right stance. And that stance, to my mind, must embrace, not just accept the fact, that our European neighbors are more like us than any other countries in the world. They're more important to us economically than any other countries in the world. And that they are more aligned with our geopolitical interests than any other continent in the world. The idea that our security depends as much on the Indo-Pacific as it does on the European Eastern Front, or that we can be a player in that theater to the same extent as we are a player in Europe, is in my view misguided. It's as misguided as the idea that Britain is going to be a global regulatory superpower rivaling the EU, the US, or China. It's just not going to happen. In a world where blocks matter, and that is the world that exists today, we need to recognize our interests and act accordingly. This does not mean reopening or renegotiating or relitigating the 2016 referendum. Brexit is a fact. I always feared it would be a net negative, but it did not need to be as bad as this. And foreign policy, geopolitics, and global problems offers a prime area, in my view, where we should be forging common ground with other Europeans. In the last integrated defense review, which was published uh, three years ago, uh, there was a pretense that the EU didn't exist. We need that mindset to change. We should be all in on the European political community for a very simple reason. It offers us the chance to combine our strengths with those of allies. Ditto, we should be all in on European energy security. We should be cooperating with the EU on security and defense and are offering to help bridge EU and NATO. We should be shoulder to shoulder with the EU on climate. The current government have highlighted a common European approach to migration. Fine. That should include minimum standards for refugees and asylum seekers, in my view. In a speech last week, Michael Heseltine said we need a, a minister for enhancing relations with Europe. That actually makes sense. At the moment, if you go to the Foreign Office website, there is a Minister of State for the Indo-Pacific and a Parliamentary Undersecretary for Europe. That just doesn't make sense. So that leads to the fourth and final part of the equation, right-sizing what we can afford. Maybe I don't need to say it, but I will. It's a good thing that not everything costs money because we haven't got enough of it to go around. So we can start with things that don't cost money. We cannot advocate for the rule of law for others if we do not follow it ourselves. We will not get to sign trade deals with India if we do not let Indians come and study and visit. We cannot expect fully, ex fully effective European cooperation on migration, including in respect of channel crossings, if we do not cooperate with the rest of Europe on sorting out the Northern Ireland Protocol. So we need to stop snookering ourselves internationally by what we do domestically. But we need to do more. And that means thinking about what we can afford, because budgets can't be spent twice. Our defense, diplomacy, development, intelligence, and climate budgets are investments, in my view, in our own security, our own influence, and our own strength. But they're competing for cash with health, education, transport. Our defense budget is about 42 billion pounds last year. The aid budget, about 11 billion pounds, the cut aid budget the intelligence budget, three billion, and the much reduced diplomacy budget, about one billion. Just for comparison, the Chinese defense budget is over $200 billion, and the American defense budget is over $700 billion. My suggestion would be to prioritize the smaller budgets on the grounds that this is where the marginal million pounds can go furthest in advancing our interests. Of course, given the job I do, I am passionate about the substance and the soft power that comes from our aid budget. But I want to make a different point. We could double our intelligence and diplomacy budgets for the same cost as a 10% increase in our defense budget. And I would bet we would get more for that doubling than for the extra 10%. Since we are no longer in a position to be a superpower or a super connector, we can be a supercharger on key issues as long as we're focused. And if we follow this approach, we can debate 
the priorities. Some people will argue that the priorities should be geographic. For example, East Africa, which I recently mentioned, where Britain is a missing player on problems of regional and global significance. Others will say we should focus sectorally. I would like to see Britain address the climate conflict interface where new thinking is desperately needed. Others will say we could be an institute, we could have an institutional focus. The international financial institutions, for example, desperately need new thinking, and we sit on critical governing bodies. We need these institutions to have an ambitious agenda if the world is to manage the challenges of the decades ahead. But at the moment, the British voice is mute. And others will say the priorities can be defined by population groups. I'm, I was here uh, yesterday for the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative, and there's a case that thinking about women and girls in the world who are aged 20, 10 to 30 are the next change makers in the world, and you can have a focus on that. In all cases, my argument is we should be guided by the imperatives of speaking with humility, not hubris, of acting with others, not alone, of pursuing a rules-based order against the law of the jungle, and above all, ensuring that our domestic actions are in sync with rather than in opposition to our foreign policy aspirations. Let me just finish, Bronwyn, on the following uh, point. One of the problems with the way sovereignty has been defined in the Brexit debate is that it has peddled the illusion that there's a world where our destiny only depends on our own decisions. That world does not exist, in my view. The truth is that our future depends on the interaction of our decisions with the decisions of others. Respect, wisdom, trust, credibility, and imagination are not actually expensive, but they've been sorely lacking as we've cycled through five prime ministers and six foreign secretaries since 2016. We can start by bringing them back, but they need substantive articulation and focus. That, in my view, is the next task. Thank you very much indeed. David, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it was a terrific sweep of things. And um, you've managed, I, I was saying before um, you gave this talk, to, in my view, calibrate things just right in terms of the tone of how we should see Britain. It's, it's very hard it, it, within the UK sometimes to get away from the tone of either boosterism on one hand or a kind of defensiveness or then gloom uh, at the other end of the uh, spectrum. So thank you for that. I wanted to put to you one of the, you've, you've cast it also very much in the, in the sense of decisions that governments should take, while I note your last bit about the, you know, the effect of this depends on other countries and other people's decisions as well. What do you think a British government ought to do about migration? Well, I think that um, there are a couple of, first of all, thank you for what you said about um, the, speech, the speech. In respect of uh, migration, um, there's a particular interest that I've got, and then there's a more general point. The particular interest is that in respect of refugees and asylum seekers, Britain should be upholding the best of international commitments rather than seeking to get around them. Uh, we take a relatively small proportion of the world's refugees and of the world's asylum seekers, but we also process their cases very slowly, which I think is wrong. And um, I run a humanitarian organization, but that doesn't mean that I believe every single person who applies for asylum is going to get it. There should be a system. Uh, it should be run briskly and fairly. And I think the imperative is that Britain is part of an international uh, determination to uphold one part of the, the uh, post-war settlement, which was that people who are fleeing for their lives deserve sanctuary. And the US has recently said that it's, the Biden administration said they're gonna take 125,000 refugees on resettlement route um, every year. Um, Britain in recent years has taken low single digit thousands. Uh, the last calculation I did was six or seven per parliamentary constituency. No one is going to tell me that doubling or trebling that number is going to. Uh, All right, but we're talking, the, the, you know, the, the, the past year or so, we're talking about net uh, immigration of, of half a million, much of which represents uh, a deliberate choice to take in let me come up, from let me come Ukraine so, so, and I said, uh, I've got a particular, I've got a, I've got a particular interest of people who are fleeing from conflict. Mm. So there's an agenda around that. Secondly, you've then got a wider set of migration issues. I mean, the Hong mm. Kong uh, mm. uh, uh, example is, is, is one. Ukraine, uh, obviously, Afghanistan. Um, on the, on the uh, 
on the wider migration point, it's evident that there are significant economic reasons why uh, the country needs uh, migrants to be here, um, and it defends that. Now, we can't, in my view, have a migration policy independent that, that, that pretends that we're not part of a European continent. And it's vital that we have effective systems that replace those that existed when we were in the European Union. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm not getting into the numbers uh, with you, but, and I'm happy if you want to ask me a more specific question, but it seems to me you've got one agenda about people who are fleeing conflict, another agenda about the social and economic needs of the country. It's good that you're happy that if I ask you a more s specific question, because um, I um, wonder how you would, as a British politician, if you were still that, persuade people to take these numbers in. You've, say, you've said, look, we owe it, uh, to, and you've, you've answered particularly in terms of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and you've said it's also good for the country, it's good for growth. Um, but it remains one of the big points of un unease. I happen to show your views. But it remains one of the big points of unease, one of the, arguably one of the drivers of Brexit, one of the things that this government and, and clearly Labour to some extent are very, very uncomfortable well, let, Let's with. accept that it was, that, that, that there are hmm. concerns hmm. Uh, about that. Um, the concerns, I think, are about quote unquote uncontrolled migration, because that hmm. is the spectre hmm. that is thrown up. And I think that um, if you look at the debates, not just in this country, but in other countries, hmm. The, the, the sense that there is no national or international controls that exist on migration is a significant part of it. I think there's a second aspect which is very important as well, which is whether countries are, whether other countries are bearing their weight. If you look at the debate in Germany or the debate in Sweden, a significant aspect of the resentment was around what other countries were doing. Uh, and so I think that we should be very, whether you're in politics or not, it's important, I think, to be very clear that there are responsi legal responsibilities as well as moral responsibilities in respect of those who are fleeing for their lives. There are then national interests in respect of uh, an immigration policy, and those should be addressed in a context in which there is control over who comes in, and that there is a, a, an international engagement about who bears the responsibility. Thank you, thank you for that. I was fascinated by your, um, your putting this weight on impunity as, as, as you, you put it, and said that you thought that that's where um, that the international dimension really, really sits. And I wondered who you thought countries then ought to be accountable to, or to what, uh, if, if, if they're escaping or evading accountability. Um, because, you know, in the domestic context, it, democracies, their governments, are accountable to voters, repeatedly. Well, but, but, you know, internationally, if you're talking about that, who who is Britain accountable to for deciding to not to observe a, a treaty other than the other counterparts of that, that treaty? Well, we are, well, first of all, we are accountable to other. You've yes. anticipated well, yeah. part of where this goes. You're accountable to, other, uh, to, to others who are abiding by the treaty. And there are sanctions mm. against, not, not, I don't mean economic sanctions, there's, there's, there's commitments that are made. And if you don't meet them, there's redress for, for others. But let me just pick up this question in something that matters a lot to me. Our staff get killed in the places that we work by combatants in battle, sometimes by quote unquote accident, sometimes deliberately. Uh, we had a really terrible recent case in Ethiopia. We've had other cases in uh, Syria. Now, the accountability there for the people who decided to launch the missile from the drone, or in the Syrian case, launch the missile that hit an, an IRC ambulance from the uh, fighter jet, is, pursue, is very hard to pursue. But there's a very interesting uh, example. In the German court system, they've used the universal jurisdiction provisions mm. to try in absentia <coughs> uh, Syrian generals, not for our incident, but for other incidents. So I think your question about where accountability can be exercised is a very reasonable one. There isn't one answer to it. Mm. Sometimes it will be through a legal system. Sometimes it will be through other uh, systems. The, the uh, US uh, uh, announced an executive order yesterday about sanctions on individuals who perpetrate sexual violence in uh, conflict, a presidential uh, memorandum. So I would say we need multiple um, avenues to pursue those who act with impunity. Not, there's not a singular one. Hmm. Where do you put 
um, Iraq in this. Um, you mentioned it uh, in, in, in one sentence, and I'm not going to give it disproportionate weight in this, but it is, is one point when people look at the UK's record, they say, well, what about that? And President Putin indeed says, uh, you know, precisely, well, what, what about that um, in terms of, uh, of acting internationally within the law? Well, I think it was an error, but not an act of impunity. So I don't think it was an illegal act. I think it was an error. Um, yes. Um, let, let's, let's, let's take it as, a, as, a, as an error then, um, and perhaps build on that to say, I mean, you talked a bit about Britain's strength in defense and in intelligence, which is something that, that comes up repeatedly, comes up in our work, in our project here. Uh, as one of the more solid um, cornerstones, if you like, of Britain's reputation in the world at the moment. But over, over these, that does hang the question of Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Um, either is something uh, that has damaged, uh, two experiences uh, uh, that have damaged Britain's standing, or is revelations, if you're perhaps a bit more generous, revelations of the lack of influence that Britain has over uh, American policy and I'm thinking particularly of the Afghan ex exit there. And so in this perspective that you're offering us, where, where do you put these, these, t these two wars that did not go to plan, if I can use British understatement? Well, they're an important part of the post-Cold War story, uh, I think. And they should be addressed with humility and with openness mm -hmm. and with transparency. Now. I have an interesting perspective on, you know, you mentioned Afghanistan. There are 3,000 IRC employees in Afghanistan. Uh, they will tell you that the opportunities and freedoms that they've, be, that they've gained in the last 20 years are something that they want to work to preserve. Yeah. So I think it's a story with texture and with many aspects. Uh, but there are clearly, I mean, I, I argued in office that no military strategy, no development strategy, um, no aid strategy could work without a political settlement that could hold the country together. And that was, that was a lonely furrow to plough at the time because people say, no, you've got to win the military battle first and then you've got to do the, the politics. I don't think it works like that. So I think you've got to learn the right lessons as well as telling the right uh, story. So I think the best thing is to be, is to be open and engage with it. I served on something called the Afghan Study Group, which was mm. uh, established by the US Congress um, uh, and run under the US Institute of Peace, which <coughs> foreshadowed many, it was published in February of last year, so it foreshadowed many of the debates that have happened since the fall of the Ghani mm. uh, government. I think that we should be open and we should engage with it. Mm. Um, no, and as you said, engage, engage with um, you know, the things that went wrong. What would you say to British politicians now who are trying to make, as you, as, as, as you put it, the case for being a global magnet for the many things attractive about the UK? On the other hand, it is an undeniably very difficult time to run many democracies, but particularly the UK. The country does not have the money um, to afford uh, many of the things that voters and governments would, would like. Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously the, the home front is the preeminent issue in the front of people's minds. And it's very hard to be strong internationally if you're weak domestically, if you're weak economically, or if you're um, chaotic politically. And so I think the rebuilding does have to start at home. I don't think there's any, um, th there's any option there. However, I'm, I'm nervous or I'm, I'm skeptical of the argument that you can just ignore the international dimension. So many of the things that are important to the future of the country have an international dimension, not just a domestic dimension. That the idea that you can take a holiday from foreign policy for the decade and then come back in 2030 and re-engage, I don't think holds. And that's why I think we've got to be able to calibrate an international stance that is yeah. becoming for the ambitions we yeah. have domestically, but also for the responsibilities that we have internationally. Thank you for that. Um, we might come back to some of those points, but I wonder if we can turn to questions now, because I think there are going to be a lot. If we can have the lights. So, yes, there are loads and loads and loads. Um, I'm going to start, though, with two on, 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 online, and they're marvellously succinct um, and probably anticipate a point that others are going to ask. One from Dina Mufti, uh, who said, I uh, appreciate for this question to be asked on my behalf. How has Brexit impacted the UK economically? Is there a case for the UK rejoining the EU? And along with that, from Robert Elkeloos, it is apparent that Brexit is a disaster for the UK. Why will our politicians not admit this and talk about it? 
Well, Brexit is not working economically uh, as well as not working. Sorry, do you want me to answer that or do you want to take more? No, Sorry. no, 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 you can answer, that. You answer um, those as, as they go together. I'm uh, taking them as one. Uh, Brexit is not uh, working uh, economically, just as I argued, it's not been helpful geopolitically. Um, it's not working economically because it's not been quote unquote done uh, because any business will tell you that there's an enormous amount still to be uh, worked through. There's a, a microcosm of the bigger issue is the story of the European charter mark, the kite mark mm. that applies to, to goods, the CE kite mark, which the current government has repeatedly, or the, or the successive current governments, have <laughs> repeatedly um, uh, said they're going to abolish and replace with a British kite mark, but have then repeatedly postponed the date when that's happened. They've just announced it's gonna be postponed until 2023, because they haven't got an alternative uh, to it. And so, you don't have to take my word for it. Just look at what the Office of Budget Responsibility or anyone else says. 15% reduction in trade intensity, at least a 4% reduction in national uh, income uh, in a very competitive world. And so uh, I would urge people to look at what the US are doing. Just in one, one example of the future of the global economy is going to be partly about uh, decarbonization. Look at what the US is putting behind the low carbon effort they're making through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. People think it's a $369 billion act. That's only the price on the tin. Actually, it's uh, driven by the number of businesses who make the investments that trigger the investment incentives. There are credible estimates. It's, it's going to be worth at least twice the $369 billion. The EU is responding as well. It's very worried that there's a protectionist element, the incentives for production in the US. Britain's not in that conversation uh, at the moment. So I, I think it's, I think that um, the, 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 evidence, the evidence is that Brexit is not done and there are problems that need to be fixed pretty urgently. And I don't know whether the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister has the um, wiggle room in his own party to, to, to fix them, but it's, it's essential for the future that, it, that they are. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, let me take two, two at a time. One um, over here. All right, um, Kim Sen Gupta from The Independent. Um, there will be a new government here probably in two years' time, judging by the opinion polls, now that there is a huge change in, in public opinion. Would it not make sense for the EU to wait for that and the Starmer government who will have more wiggle room than Rishi Sunak has and would not be so beholden to the DRG or um, the DUP and they can ask you uh, following your interview with um, Andy Ma last night about your own intentions about domestic politics um, I think you said when you, when you were asked by Andy whether you intend to stand for the Commons it hasn't been decided yet um, what does that mean my interview was about my speech today, actually, rather than about my own uh, career. And what I said to him is, I always say the same thing, which is that I make my professional decisions on the basis of where I think I can make the most impact consistent with my commitments to my own family. And so it was boringly uh, the same answer that I always give. On the, on the waiting for government, look, I think the EU want a strong relationship with the UK. The, the, uh, and they should get on with it. And uh, anyone who's a a Brit should be, should be saying to the current government, in my view, get serious, get on with it. Uh, so I don't think the EU are in the, they're not in a, in a waiting a game. Uh, they can see it's not working and they, they want to fix it. Thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Caroline Johns, for asking the same question about your own intentions. And can, can you give a Chatham House a scoop today? Answer no. <laughs> thank you. All right, um, it was here, one, one in the front, and then I'm going to go back on the aisle there. Thank you. Salman Sheikh, um, founder of the Sheikh Group, Chatham House member. Good to see you here, David. Um, on this issue of accountability, I want to ask you about international institutions today. Are they fit for purpose? And of course, here, I talk about the UN Security Council in particular, where whether it's error or willful, you have a Security Council member in Russia that is been bombing with impunity, Syrian bread lines as well as now um, uh, apartment blocks in Ukraine. Okay, thank you. And can we take one on the aisle back there? Thank you. I, w I will come over here. 
Hi, uh, Jonathan saying a Chatham House member. Actually, following up on the on the last one, um, this reframing of uh, the sort of competition between democracies and autocracies into uh, accountability versus impunity. What is the arena of that competition when it comes to the state, in get state, uh, state engagement? Are we talking about trying to convince China to follow rules, for example, or Iran or, or other autocracies? Are we trying to devise a new rules-based system that uh, countries may choose to align with, with instead of aligning with, with China? Um, so a bit more on like how, how that works on a state-by-state -state level. Mm -hmm. Great questions, thanks. Accountability, the UN Security Council on Russia, and um, more into this um, look, impunity. I mean, look, all of the international institutions, be they political or economic, are uh, desperate need for updating, but the vested interests make it very hard to do so. Salman, you know, 15 years ago, we, we, there was a, an agenda for reform of the UN Security Council, expanding membership, changing terms, etc. but uh, it's very hard to see that going anywhere. Um, I think that, that there's a couple of things I would point to in respect of the case that you uh, raised of the, of the I mean, the, uh, 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 we went through this, um, uh, the IRC, with the bombing of Aleppo, and now in, in Ukraine we're seeing the same. Um, two, two things. One, there's a French proposal that the veto in the Security Council should be um, surrendered in cases of mass atrocity. And it's a proposal that's supported by 100 members of the General Assembly, and I'm going to come back to that General Assembly point in a moment. Um, we argued as IRC when we published our emergency watch list last December, and we'll do so again in two weeks' time, in support of that proposal. Now, Britain has not used its veto since 1989 in the um, Security Council. Um, but, of course, there's the use of the veto and there's the threat to use the veto or the knowledge that the veto could be used that circumscribes diplomacy even when the veto isn't actually uh, used. I think it would be, um, I think that's a very good proposal, and I think it deserves support. Um, and of course, none of the other members of the Security Council are yet committed to that proposal, but I think it's a good one. And I think that the point about mass atrocity is important, because of course, what you, you often hear is, well, who defines a mass atrocity? Well, that's also something that deserves its own independent assessment. Because one of the things that I know from dealings with the UN is that UN officials are subject to pressure around the world uh, because they operate by the consent of the host government in all the places where they are. Um, so there's one thing is about the use of the veto. The second is I think there's um, an important development this year. It was a Liechtenstein proposal, I think, which is that whenever the veto is used, the, the issue is referred to the General Assembly. And I think the General Assembly finding its voice is a positive uh, aspect of that. We're thinking at the moment about our this year's watch list and what to do about cases where there's the denial of aid access. Because at the moment, that's happening in the dark, effectively, in a number of uh, places. And so I think thinking about the role of the General Assembly in the UN system is also a fruitful uh, area. I'm not saying abandon UN Security Council reform and wider things, and obviously there's a whole set of other institutions. Um, in respect of the question that was asked about uh, the rules-based system. M my view on this is that we don't need new rules, actually. The rules were set out very, very clearly after the Second World War. Interestingly enough, I'm, I don't know if he's a Chatham House member, but Rana Mitter um, at Oxford has written an extraordinary book about um, how the pre-1949 Chinese government, what role they had in the debates about setting up the post-Second World War order, and also some fascinating material from under the Xi Jinping presidency of claiming credit for some of the creation of the post-Second World War. It's often described as a Western creation. That's actually not true. It was designed by democracies and dictatorships, capitalist countries and communist um, countries. So I don't think we need new rules. I think we need to uphold the rules that exist. And that's the basis, I think, for any kind of um, effective international system. Now, built into, the, 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 built into that post-Second uh, World War system was obviously the rights of states, which was a 300-year-old um, commitment. But for the first time in international law, the rights of citizens were written into international law. And that tension runs through the documentation, but it also has run through the debates since then. There was no golden age. Laurie Friedman always tells me, look, whenever you talk about impunity, don't, don't, don't leave the 
uh, implicit impression that somehow there was a golden age pre-1990. The Cold War was full of abuses of international uh, rights as well. But my very strong view is that upholding the current rules is a far more fruitful way of going forward than trying to invent new ones. And that includes, to answer the, the, the question, trying to persuade China and Iran and others to follow those. Yes, I don't think we should be naive about it. So, quote unquote, how can we persuade China? I think that there's a danger of us sound, of sounding naive about it. But live up to them ourselves. And remember that China has been a beneficiary of the rule. I, I would argue we've been beneficiaries of the rules-based system. But China has been a beneficiary of the rules-based system as well. And um, I think it's the, 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 the strategic uh, goal for a world that faces the kind of global risks that I've described yeah. is to have one system, not multiple systems. Thank you. And I just want to bring in a question on China. Has anyone else got a question on China? Here, yeah. they're all on other things. All right, at, at, at the back there, and I'm going to take one online here. Um, uh, Patrick Shire Sikorsky, uh, Chatham House member. Um, yeah, I have, I've, I have a question on our relationship with China, and um, I guess it's at what, what what level should we be engaging with them? Because on the one hand, the more uh, the more the, the more collaboration, the more trade you have with, with with your geopolitical rivals, the more likely theoretically they are to become like us. But we've also seen that that doesn't doesn't always work out that way. So where is the wh how do we strike a balance between strengthening our rivals and engaging with them and perhaps preventing the chance of conflict? Thank you very much for that. And I'm going to weave into that from Celia Mazard uh, de Pablo. Mr. Bill, Mr. Miliband, do you share Mr. Sunak's views about China? Thank you. Um, I'll express my own, because um, the Prime Minister said yesterday he, he wants to be robustly pragmatic, as opposed to what kind of pragmatism? I mean, they're sort of floppily pro pragmatic, I suppose, is the alternative of robustly pragmatic. But uh, uh, the, the way I would describe it is as follows. First, I don't think that it's a fair um, description of the post-1990 approach, that there was a kind of, if we trade with China, they'll become like us. I think there were some statements made that, were, that, that get trotted out. But I think that we should, that shouldn't be the basis of our trading relationship. We should trade if we think it's in our interest to do so. Now, secondly, there are areas where trade is completely um, beneficial to both sides. And there are tra there's trade where it becomes uh, more uh, dangerous and, and difficult, no notably in the military domain. And what I see um, across the West, actually, the European Union did this. Now the Americans have adopted it. Um, I think it would have been helpful if the Prime Minister had said it last night. There are areas where the relationship between the West and China has that there are red lines of both sides. And it's important for those red lines to be clear. There are areas where there is competition. And that competition can be fair or it can be unfair. And then there are areas where there is necessary cooperation. And climate would be an example. Health pandemics would be a, an example as well. I served on something called the International Panel on um, Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Uh, th there's no future safeguard against pandemics that doesn't involve engagement with um, uh, China. Now, my concern over the last couple of years has been that that third area of cooperation is going to be close to zero. Actually, coming out of the last G20 meeting, the, the commitment, and John Kerry deserves a lot of credit for this, the, the determination to, of the Americans now to engineer a conversation with China about the climate issue, I think, is, is positive. And so I, I, I find that three-part distinction. There are areas of potential confrontation where red lines are important, there are areas of competition, and then there are areas of uh, cooperation. I think that's the way to try and sort out a multifaceted relationship with China that recognizes its own distinctive place in the global uh, system. Thanks for that. I'm now gonna, thank you for being so patient. Um, the side of the room, right in the middle, towards the back. Uh, Sean Curtin, member of Chatham House. Uh, thank you, uh, David, for uh, giving us a sort of roadmap to improve uh, relations with uh, the EU and the wider world. But um, don't you think that a lot of the energy which we could use for this will actually be turned 
internally to deal with the consequences of Brexit. And I'm thinking here about Scottish independence and the status of Northern Ireland. You mentioned the Northern Ireland Protocol. I would point out the majority of people in Northern Ireland actually are quite happy with the situation as it is at the moment. And of course, Brexit gave us about 62% of Scots wanted to stay in the EU and 56% of people in Northern Ireland. So the problem is that we're going to have to look, deal with those very difficult issues. Thank you. Really good question, thank you. And right in the middle, quite near you. Yes. Thanks very much. Christopher Hill, Cambridge University. Um, there have been so many agonising reappraisals of British foreign policy since the 1960s, and arguably they haven't made much difference to the hubris you were talking about. Um, one of them, the Bell Report, said that we should identify with what it called analogue states, of which the most obvious is France. What, in your view, are the significant differences of interest between ourselves and France? I, I just, let me answer the second question first. I did the, it, it, every year there's um, an Anglo-French colloque, and um, it's, it, one year it takes place in... Uh, it's not an intergovernmental thing, it's a civil society um, uh, meeting. And one year it takes place in Versailles, another year it takes place in the UK. And in 2009, Bernard Kushner, who was the French foreign minister, and I, we gave each other's speeches. So I gave the French report on the last year, and he gave the British report on the last uh, year. And the, the, the reason for making that point is that um, the similarities are, of our interest are much greater than the differences in our interest. I see that at the UN. Uh, uh, and I see, and I see the potential here as well. So my, I don't want to be glib about it, but two countries that love love to rib each other, actually do so because they've got so much in common. And so I'm sure that doesn't do justice to uh, Ken Beryl's original uh, report or to your learning on the um, on the subject. I think that, um, ironically, uh, Britain has always had more in common with French designs for Europe than it has with German designs for Europe. The Germans have been always more federal in their conception of uh, Europe. Mitterrand originally proposed this concentric circles uh, model that uh, the European com political community partly uh, represents. And so um, I feel that uh, while there, are, there can be differences in some, some aspects of global policy, I think that the, the overriding interests are um, similar rather than mm. rather than separate. Um, just in Sean's original question, I mean, one reason I, I, I would say, and again, I don't want to be flippant about it, but uh, the, the majority of Northern Ireland electors and parties uh, are, are content with the Northern Ireland Protocol because they're in the single market. So it ra I sort of feel it rather makes my um, point about the need for us to um, organise relations with the European single market in a way that is, that is, that is mutually beneficial. And the 15% reduction in trade intensity um, doesn't make sense. Just to be clear, I've not actually been advocating that we rejoin the single market. I think that you can achieve alignment that focuses on the trade issue. This is partly what the discussion with Andrew Marr yesterday was about. Um, and then you can deal with the migration issues uh, separately. Um, and in respect of, of the situation in Scotland, I mean, Scots sh should and will speak for themselves um, on that. <coughs> Myself, I don't understand how people who are passionately against Brexit can passionately advocate Skegsit. I think that it, that, that it, it doesn't add up. And I think that the, the opinion polling I've seen rather speaks to concerns in the Scottish population uh, about, that, about that issue. Thanks for that. We could have a whole session, and indeed quite a bit of the project is, is about how Britain reforges relations with the EU. We could debate endlessly that, that one about whether the EU will allow Britain to separate single market um, closeness from migration issues. But let's squeeze in two more in the middle there, and then I'm... William Horsley, University of Sheffield. Mr Miliband, I wonder what issues are raised uh, in your mind for Britain by the fact that so many former Commonwealth countries uh, like South Africa and India 
uh, were unwilling to vote for the General Assembly resolution which you, you mentioned. And, and the, the suggestion is that they see double standards uh, from Britain and the West in, in general, in international behavior, cross-border behavior, uh, and the upholding of the rule of law and so on. Uh, by the way, the, the Commonwealth, uh, the Jamaican and the Caribbean Commonwealth is talking about reparations as a, as a high agenda item. Now, Britain is trying to put the issue of governance, the rule of law, and indeed media freedom onto the agenda. The law ministers have passed something in that direction. It has to go to the heads of government. And there's an issue here about accountability on all sides. So how do you think the, the current British government should, should handle this entangled web of uh, expectations of, of Britain and, and the indeed perhaps the, the lack of consistency on our own part. Yeah. If I might just tag on one thing, have you not left out one item talking about Europe's role in this? Because if Germany, Italy, France and the others had been less Russia friendly over the last 20 years and more Britain had had a larger role, would we be in the current situation where Putin was tempted to cross that border. Oh, marvellous, many-sided question, thank you. And I'm going to take in the, in the back, in the yellow. I'm so sorry to all the others. There's been a lot of hands up, quite justifiably. Uh, Rashmin Sagu, Director of the International Law Programme here at Chatham House. Thank you for your many references to the importance of upholding um, the rules-based international order. I, I just wondered how could we better engage with the British public on the importance of the UK's leadership in upholding international law so that when even threats to breach international law get the public outcry that they deserve? Good questions. Um, just on, on William Halsey's point, I mean, I, to be fair to my remarks, I actually made the point that you made, which is that India and South Africa and Indonesia is obviously not a slightly different category, but um, uh, they are annoyed by what they see as um, double standards. And there is a, but, but my reply is there's an awful lot of whataboutery when it comes to the, the Russian issue. Now, I actually think there's something very interesting going on, which is if you compare the UN resolution that you referred to, where 141 countries in the UN voted to condemn the invasion, but of the 50 that didn't, they represent about uh, uh, half of the world's population, I think 55%, and they included uh, countries like um, India and uh, South Africa. Interesting thing going on, come the G20 summit uh, earlier this month, there's been that, uh, a pretty significant move that text is much more forward, and um, the, the pain of the war is becoming more evident globally, not just, um, not just in Ukraine. I think on the, look, it's a separate conversation about Russia, but the, yes, you're right to point out the um, uh, dependent, the, the, the argument that was made that Russia was as dependent on Europe for buying its energy as Europe was for, on Russia for supplying it. Um, that, that's a good argument that you made, but the, Russian, the, 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 the other Europeans would also say to us, look, the UK has got its own fair share of responsibility and not cracking down hard enough on a whole range of Russian money, et cetera, that's in London. So there's, if, if it gets into a blame game, we're all going to lose. There, there, there's pretty significant uh, lessons. I, I think back to 2008, and I think one of the, fir the first thing I had to do in the Foreign Office was decide what to do about the refusal of the Russian government to cooperate in the prosecution of those who murdered Litvinenko. And we took an unprecedented step at the time of kicking out eight Russian uh, diplomats. Um, but I, don't, I didn't believe at the time that Russia could become as great a threat to global order as it then subsequently did become. And I regret not taking more literally as well as seriously the 2007 speech that President Putin made to the Munich Security Conference that flagged pretty clearly some intentions in that uh, regard. I think there was a degree of complacency, if, if, you, li I, uh, if you like, that um, saw Russia as a declining global power and therefore didn't take seriously enough its ability to be uh, such a destabilizing influence uh, globally, which hasn't, as, as someone indicated, has not just been on, uh, in Europe, it's also been in the Middle East. Um, I mean, the last question is a, is a, is a great uh, is, a, is a great question. Um, I think that the first thing I would say is that when newspaper headlines celebrate the ripping up 
of the rule of law, not to be cowed by that. I think that's very, very important. Uh, I think, secondly, the um, explanation of the gains that we make from living by a rules-based system is very, very important as well and is not done well enough. And you often hear people, I, I referred this to the question that was asked about China, and people often say, well, China's got so much out of the rules-based order since, uh, well, since 1990, really, since joining the WGF. We've got a lot out of it as well. So I think that, that that's an important um, part of it. I also think, thirdly, and this may be something that you and Chatham House can think about, um, the Council on Foreign Relations, I don't know if they're your sister body in... Uh... Actually, they're not quite sister, but founded at the same time in the wake of the First World War in the spirit of never again to bring rigour to foreign affairs. So since you ask, yes. Yeah. Uh, they, a they've, historic they've, relationship. But, and this is going to sound sort of rather um, Sunday sermonish, but they have really tried to take seriously what public education means about foreign affairs. And they've got a programme that tries to get um, material into the hands of mosques and churches and synagogues uh, every week. They've got a program in high schools. And as I say, it can sound a bit sort of do-goody, but actually it's good to do good. Mm. And actually that, that agenda of civic and public uh, education is incredibly important. I think especially in, 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 the, in the modern age where it's so easy to get material uh, out, high quality engagement um, feels to me really, really important. And so the work, I don't know much about your uh, project here, but I, it feels to me that there's an important civic society responsibility as well as responsibilities on politicians there. Maybe it's because I'm no longer a politician, but I think that um, the, 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 the Abraham Lincoln said that the toughest job in the world is to be a citizen. And I think there's responsibilities on those of us who are not politicians as well as those responsibilities on those who are. Thank you for that. Well, the international law program here, which um, dates back to the years we're talking about, and in, in, in fact, um, as a uh, distinguished history of addressing many of these questions. We are sadly going to have to stop now, and I'm so sorry. There's, there have been terrific questions, and I'm sure the others that would follow would be as well, but thank you for those. Thank you for those online, which were great, um, and thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking David Miliband. <laughs>